Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? That good, huh? Awesome. It's kind of good, good to be back here. I spent, spent Thanksgiving. Um, no one's listening to me. Are you listening? Okay. Okay, thank you. Spent Thanksgiving uh, in Oregon, uh, in part in La Pine, in, on the coast, and uh, glad to be back. It was, uh, it was seven degrees in La Pine when I was there, so it was beautifully warm and wonderful. Yeah, seven, seven degrees. I'm, I'm glad to be back home and be here, so I'm glad to see your faces today. If you're visiting, welcome. Uh, man, just join in with our family. We're going to worship God today. We're going to sing his praises. We're going to lift him up. That's what we do here, and that's what we're good at. That's what, we're, that's what we, we were created to do was worship God. Amen? So if you would stand.
this next song. That was beautiful. You know, there's nothing like, as worship leaders up here, being able to hear you guys sing out and praise God. That's what we long for. So I'm going to ask you to amp it up a little bit more. And let's, let's, let's praise the Lord this morning. Amen. seated. So glad that you're here with us today. The lion, that's who we serve. Amen. 
God is so good and so grateful that he goes before us. He fights our battles for us. He's the God that loves us and loves you. And I hope you hear that loud and clear today. God loves you and is so glad that you're here today. And I want to welcome you, especially if today's your first day. Thanks for coming and being with us today. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, God has got wonderful things in store. And uh, we look forward to a great, great day together. I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind, take out your bulletin. We have a few things to highlight. Just want to uh, share with you, uh, we have uh, just a wonderful privilege today. Dr. Stummo and his wife, Joanna, are with us today. They're going to be sharing with us, which uh, Dr. Stummo is the president of our denomination of the Christian Missionary Alliance. And uh, so we look very forward to, uh, to hearing from him a little bit later. And uh, he brought this really cool little pamphlet. Just want to highlight this to you. Check this out. This is just good information that tells you again that as we've been talking here, you know, we yes, uh, God has us planted here in Wickenburg, but we are part of something so much bigger than just ourselves, and we're part of a denomination that's amazing, and God does wonderful things through. And, and just look at the stats on this. It's just cool. I love this, how it says here, the one that has the green page here. To, just so that you know, uh, again, what we're a part of, uh, you know, who we are, Christ-centered. We, are, we start with Jesus. He's the one who's the source of our love, the cause of our worship and the core of our message. And that's what it's about. You know, here at Community Alliance here in Wickenburg, our, our heart, our, our heartbeat, if you will, the vision of this church is to know Christ, that is passionately, intimately, relationally, that we know him with all our whole being, and that we make him known to the world around. And that is that we leave these doors, that we're not a holy huddle, that we exit these doors and we share Christ with those around, that they might come to the saving grace and knowledge of who he is. Uh, what a great hope we have, amen? And uh, just, uh, just again, love that. That's what we're about. Uh, check this out through the, the Alliance Ministries Worldwide. This just gives you a perspective globally, which Dr. Stumbo is going to share even greater in greater detail today. But every four minutes in, in, in an Alliance ministry, someone is praying to receive Christ every four minutes. And then every day, 43 radio towers broadcast the gospel to thousands who haven't heard. Every week, 3,000 new believers are being baptized and every month, 250 new churches and church groups join the Alliance family. Every year, 10,000 new workers are trained in 125 Alliance schools. Again, just something bigger than who we are right here in, in, in Little Wickenburg. So, again, I encourage you to take a look at this. Great information. Just uh, keeps you informed. Ways to connect. If you want more information, there's a lot of wonderful things that are here. So I encourage you to take a look at that. You also have a uh, perforated sheet here inside the bulletin. We want to encourage you. Uh, you know, we, we take it very seriously here uh, about prayer. We believe that God loves it when his people pray. And we, we ask that if you have needs or prayer requests or things in which we can bring your name before the King of Kings and the Almighty God and his throne, we would love nothing more than to do that for you. So please fill that out. In fact, as the uh, morning giving comes by, you'll see the plate. Just tear that off and throw it in there. And I want you to know your name will be going before heaven uh, this week. So we just want to, you know, encourage you with that, okay? All right. Well, those are, uh, well, actually, what else do we have? We have uh, next week, next Saturday, uh, we have Market on the Move. Now, that's uh, something, a community thing that we do. It's part of what, uh, our, uni our uniqueness here at Community Alliance, the way that we love on our community at large. And that is, extends all the way to Congress, to Gila, Salome, Whitman, Morristown. In fact, we've even had some people from Surprise come. A few from Yarnell have come. And, and that is going to be kicking up again. What is Market on the Move? It's a opportunity. We partner with a, an organization down in the Phoenix that brings uh, about six pallets of fruits and vegetables to us. And for a $15 donation, which goes to the company, okay, that uh, we, don't, we don't get that. It goes to them for bringing it up here, gas and the cost and what have you. That $15 donation gets 60 pounds of fruits and vegetables. And uh, so we, we do this, and it's going to be every second Saturday. We're starting this coming Saturday. And uh, so we encourage you, if you guys want to be part of the team that uh, helps with that, we have a, a group right here in our own body that shows up early in the morning. In fact, you'll need to be uh, next Saturday morning here outside of the parking lot at 6.30 a.m. And then uh, from 8 to 10, the actual event takes place. And then uh, we clean up shop, and we're done by 10 o'clock. And I watched a few go shiver with the cold. Yeah, it's absolutely brutal in the morning. And then you start moving around and you're good to go. So just make sure you bring a good jacket. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, so 6.30 next Saturday. So I encourage you to be a part of that. Also, we have two baptisms. Hallelujah. Two baptisms next Sunday. All right. So I uh, just want to encourage you. 
So those of you who are here now, come a little bit early, 9.30 outside, out in here in this, under this uh, black gazebo that we have over here. I want to encourage you to, uh, to come and, and uh, partake in that, be a part of that. We have a fellowship time. There's going to be some little, you know, snacks and things that we can uh, have some just, you know, a little coffee talk, a little coffee talk, you know, we'll be doing that. So I encourage you for that. And then we're going to get the witness to be baptized. So we're just excited about that. So can we give God praise for that? Isn't that cool? Hallelujah. Very excited about that. Okay. So that being said, I think those are all the announcements that we have this time. Uh, oh, no, we didn't. I thought we did, but we didn't. You're right. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, decorating. Church decorating. It's that time of year. Uh, can you believe it's December already? Holy cow, right? I mean, it'll sneak up on you like it did me. It's like, bam, here it is. Uh, this Wednesday, Deacon Deaconesses are announcing an uh, opportunity to come and decorate the church, transform this place. Uh, this year's uh, focus, this year's theme, the message we're going to be talking about is with us. We're going to be looking at Jesus and just how incredible that, you know, he's Emmanuel, the God with us. And so we're going to look at that. That's going to be the next uh, series of messages starting next Sunday. But at Wednesday at 2 o'clock, correct, Judy? Wednesday, 2 o'clock, if you want to show up, help. You know, guys, we need guys. We're going to be up here doing stuff on the rafters and things. We want to encourage you to come. Uh, gals, come out. We're going to just uh, transform this place and, and uh, give God praise for it. All right, so now that's all the announcements. So definitely, let's pray. Let's ask God's blessing today, if we will. Will you join me? Father, we love you and thank you. We are so, so grateful that you are the mighty lion. God, we thank you that you are the one who fights our battles. You're the one who goes before us and prepares the way. God, you are the one that, that loves us and guides us and instructs us. And so, God, today we ask that our heart, our mind, every part of our being would be completely vulnerable to you. God, may you speak and pour into us today. May your spirit have the power to move among us freely, to convict us, God, to teach us, to instruct us, God, just to bring glory to your name. God, we just ask that you'd move freely among us today. May we experience you in an incredible way. We ask that everything here would give you the praise you deserve. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Please stand, greet each other today in the name of the Lord.
This time, if I go ahead and have you take a seat, uh, we're going to go ahead and prepare for the morning giving. Good luck with that, right? <laughs> they can have you take a seat if you would at this time. We're going to go ahead and continue our service this morning. Well, I know he, I know you're doing it. You're working. It's all good, man. Yeah, and here in just a moment, we're going to take the morning giving. And before we do, I did forget one announcement. Got to just give this up to you and let you know. This coming Saturday, December 8th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, we are going to be hosting a Christmas celebration kind of uh, luncheon, dinner, dinner, whatever you want to call it, at uh, Padua. encourage you to come be a part of that. Uh, if you guys want to come and help and set up and tear down, we're welcome to do that too. I know that they could definitely use some more hands. Uh, so I encourage you to, to be a part of that as well. Pray for that time that uh, goes well, that they're blessed, and uh, just a, it's a real special time of celebration together. All right, so uh, before we pray for the morning giving, we have some special singers today. This is uh, Julia and Haley, and uh, Haley is going to share a song with us uh, that she has written, and uh, very excited for that, and I tell you, it's awesome. She's nervous. Can we say hi? Can we say hi real quick? Hi. Okay. See, we're all friends now. It's all good. It's all good. Okay, so take a breath and you got it, but uh, I'm going to pray, and then uh, we'll have you share uh, this song if you would, okay? Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you. And we ask you in Jesus' name right now. We just pray, God, that uh, what we give back to you, that we acknowledge first and foremost that you are the giver of good gifts, that all things come from you, and that, Father, that you are the, the one who provides. And so, God, as we give back to you today, may we do so as your scripture tells us in a way that has a cheerful heart. God, that gives you praise. That's us just being open-handed to say, God, we love you. And we want to support what you're doing. And so, Father, as we give, may your hand be on it. May it, may it uh, be multiplied. God, may many lives be transformed because of it. And may many find freedom in you. God, you're good and wonderful. We give you the thanks and praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Is it good? Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, so like Monchi said, my name's Haley. Um, I'm from Waco, Texas, and I'm here... Um, receiving uh, treatment for my eating disorder at the Meadows Ranch. And um, basically one night I was just kind of outside watching the sunset, which Arizona has very pretty sunsets. And um, I just kind of got this feeling on my heart to just start writing lyrics. And I've never written a song before until this one, um, or really been musical at all. But um, basically this song is just about, um, I realized I had kind of been turned away from God and blaming him for where I'm at right now. And the, I wrote this song just basically asking him for freedom, and it's called Freedom. And just it's about me giving him my life and letting go and just fully surrendering. So, yeah. Okay. <clears throat>
won't give up this fight. Reach God, me. take my hand. I'll stretch for you. I'm ready to let go and walk with you. So God, take my hand. I'll stretch for you. I'm ready to let go and walk with you. God, give me freedom from life I've known. Find me the key and set me free. I know that with you I will live my life. Without sadness, doubt, and fear deep inside. Well, that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's pretty sweet. Church, if you go ahead and stand, we're going to continue to lift him up. Gosh, man, God is good, isn't he? I can feel it now or in my moves. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, this is not the first time, okay? We've done this once before, but it's okay. You guys are forgiving, church? Exactly, exactly. Okay. It's hard to follow that, you know what I mean? It's, where are they at? It's their fault, you know? <laughs> I can feel it in men, and bones are about it. Oh, gosh. Okay. okay. One more time. Let's do this again. Okay. <laughs> okay. I can feel it in my bones. You're about to move. I can feel it now, <laughs> right in. <laughs> you said that you would pour your spirit out. You said that you would fall on sons and daughters. So come.
want to share with you, church, this next song, you know, that um, Christian brought last week uh, called Grateful. You know, we just ended this time this last month. We were, you know, just out of Thanksgiving and, and just looking at all the blessings and, and the ways that God is involved in our lives, how he moves uh, in ways that we don't even see. And we can't even comprehend the, the things that he's, that he's doing in heavenly places on our behalf. And we ought to be grateful for that. We ought to be thankful for it. So I got a scripture for you guys in Colossians chapter 3, 15 through 17. It says, And then let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, in which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Amen. And this is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name. And now your joy awaits my praise. And I give thanks for all you have done And I will sing of your mercy and your love Your love is unfailing And Lord, I am grateful When I was down, you brought me out You set my feet on higher ground so here i stand and you are my god your faithfulness and my solid rock come on give him thanks and i give thanks for all you have done and i will sing of your mercy and your love your love is unfailing and lord i am grateful i give thanks for all As we lift our hands, the heavens open, heavens open. So let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us. And as we lift our hands, the heavens open, heavens open. So let our lives declare clear the love our God has spoken over us. I give thanks for all you have done, and I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing, Lord, I am grateful. Thanks for all you have done And I won't forget all the battles you have won Your love is unfailing And Lord, I am grateful Lord, I am grateful Dear Lord, we give thanks today for your unending love all that you've done for us. And then even when we wandered away from you, Lord, you stayed by our side. You took care of us. In the name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand clap for that. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Well, guys, it's my distinct privilege and honor to introduce to you uh, Dr. John Stumbo, the president of our Christian Missionary Alliance. It's a pleasure to have him and his wife, Joanna, with us. And, uh, 
and uh, very, very grateful for them. So without further ado, brother, come on up. Can we honor him? <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you, brother. So glad you're here. <laughs> sure wish Pastor Monty would get some enthusiasm about him. Man. <laughs> Good morning, church. Great to be in Wickens Wickenburg. Man, I always want to throw an S in that. I'm sorry, but great to be in Wickenburg. Uh, Pastor Monty, thank you for this privilege. I know that you love this congregation and take seriously this moment of getting to stand before them. So you share nicely. Way to go. Appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my wife and I get to live in Colorado Springs. That's where the office of the Christian Missionary Alliance is. You're part of this bigger family called the Christian Missionary Alliance, and that's where the U.S. office is. Later in the service, I'm going to share with you a world tour to show you what's going on uh, more broadly in the world through the family that you're already part of. But first, I want to take us to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. I'm especially grateful to be here today, two reasons. One, we've got grandsons in Phoenix, and so when the day is over, we're going to slide down and see our grandsons. Oh, yeah, they got parents, too, my, our daughter and son-in-law, but you know how it goes, grandparents. You know how it goes. So that's one reason, extra grateful to be here. And others, you have some of the best Mexican food I've had. So we had yesterday, Wani, and got more coming. So thank you for that. And uh, 10 years ago today, literally, uh, 10 years ago today, I was in a research hospital in Oregon State on my deathbed. Joanna was being brought back into the room over the course of late November and early December that, uh, well, your husband's not responding or code blue was called or whatever. I had been a very healthy guy. I'd never had a day of illness in my life, was actually running ultra marathons. Those are races for guys too stupid to stop at 26 miles. So I was running 50, 60 kilometers up and down the mountains of Oregon, but had a mysterious attack um, on my body. Um, they were never able to diagnose it. I was released from the hospital after 77 days with a wonderful statement, you stumped us all. <laughs> we, we ran every test we had in the whole building. You flunked them all, so, but you're no longer dying, so you can go home. And uh, so I was uh, released from the hospital into the care of my wife, who became my caregiver. She took her wedding vows seriously. We stood on a Christmas Alliance platform like this one, then said for sick, for better, for worse, you know, riches and poverty, whatever we said, <laughs> sickness and in health. We didn't know what we were saying. We were kids, but, but she took those vows seriously, and so she became my nurse, and um, I, I was in a wheelchair. I was released. Really I had lost 50 pounds of muscle mass. I went from 190, which is basically what you see now, to 140 pounds, and was in a wheelchair and on a feeding tube because uh, when I talk about muscles, I, that also includes face and swallow. When a Mayo Clinic doctor explained the swallow function, uh, all these nerves and muscles in a hyoid, hyoid bone have to work in perfect synchronization for you to get the saliva that's in your mouth that you suddenly become awkwardly aware of and for you to get to the back of the throat and to swallow that. When she explained that, it was a worship moment for me. I don't even think she was a Christian, but the divine designer had created something fabulous, but mine had stopped working all together. And so for a year and a half, I didn't eat a bite of food or drink a drop of water, and Joanna was taking care of me, and it was a long journey, and I had questions. I had questions. Have any of you had questions? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's fair, it's safe to have questions with God because a question is a quest and God wants to be sought. It's one of the clearest things in all the Bible, the word to seek after God. And one of the ways we seek is through worship. I mean, what a great worship team. You got more talent on this platform than some churches of 500, you know, but, but man. So one way we see God is through worship. One way we see God is open in the Bible. But one way we see God is just bringing him our questions, those honest places of our soul. Like, Lord, what's up with that? And why is this going? And where were you? And all those kind of questions. And so if you study the Bible closely, you find that people are bringing Jesus questions all the time. And you'll also find that he doesn't always answer them the way that you'd expect 
Because not only does he understand your question, he understands what's behind the question. He understands what would happen to you if he told you the answer to your question. <laughs> he understands like so much all at one time that, that it's just fascinating to watch how he deals with the question. So we asked a lot of the why and how long kind of questions. And, and so we're going to go to a question right now here in the Bible that is loaded with misunderstanding. It shows how little the disciples understood, and it also shows how sweet our Christ is, how gracious he is, to answer their question while pointing out gently all the mistakes in their question. And so Acts 1, chapter 1, verse 6, I think you know what's going on. Jesus has died for our sins, has conquered death in the grave, has risen from the dead, and now is appearing to his disciples over the course of about seven weeks, six weeks. And um, during that time, it's the last time that he actually is in conversation with them. And I don't know if they sense that, like, it's about over, but, but they bring to him one of the questions that's been running around in their hearts. John, excuse me, Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they met together, the disciples asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, we'll unpack that a little bit. And they got the first word right, Lord. <laughs> Uh, everything else is kind of a mess, but that part was good, Lord. <laughs> and he said to them, verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Lord, would you give us understanding now of this text and would you give us understanding of what you want to say to our hearts as a result? And that we would not just be hearers. I do want us to see something we've never seen or understand something we've never understood. But may we also be doers of the word as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so why do I have a problem with that question? Why, why, do, I, why do I think they were messed up? Well, let's look at it one little piece at a time. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And what does he say to them? It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set. We rarely get the when question answered. I desperately wanted to know how long this crazy thing was going to last, this un mysterious, undiagnosed thing. When would I ever get to walk again? When I would I get to preach again? When would I get to eat again? Even the birds outside my window are eating. To be alive is to eat. I just want to eat. <laughs> oh, when, 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 when. Rarely do we get to know the when question. And God says, Jesus says to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates. The, the Father's got that taken care of. It's one of those trust things where we get thrown into this place that I guess we just have to trust you, huh? Amen. <laughs> Which irritates the daylights out of some of us, you know, but, but we just, because think of it this way. My Jesus, or our Jesus, can do anything at any time for anybody. Amen. He can do anything at any time for anybody, but often he has a very specific moment when he shows up so that, you're no, so that you know that he's the one that did it. So we don't get to know the when question very often, and that's okay. That puts us in a place of trust. So the second mistake that I find in their question, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? Lord, are you? What are you going to do? How many of you asked, have, have asked God that? Lord, what are you going to do about this? All this stuff going on in this world, all these problems in the world. Lord, what are you doing about this? And look what he says to them. It's not for you to know the times or seasons, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. Huh. Huh. They're pointing their finger at him. Lord, what are you going to do? And he turns right around and says, well, actually, I'm going to do a lot through you. 
we are always part of God's plan. You do realize that God really didn't need us to get his plan accomplished. But he wants us to be full participants in what he wants to do in this world. We get to have a part in the greatest plan of the ages. This whole thing that this whole world is about of people getting redeemed to know Christ and forgiven of their sin and placed into a relationship with the eternal God so that we're free of all the baggage and sin of our past and free to worship the eternal king and free to be welcomed into his perfect place in heaven. That's an amazing opportunity that we get to be part of not only receiving that, but sharing that. So, you've got a part. We all have a part in what God is doing in this world. Now, don't do it alone. Don't do it on your own. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So everything that we're doing, we're supposed to do engage in like a divine source of strength beyond ourselves, the Holy Spirit himself who comes into us to, to help us to love people that we wouldn't otherwise care about <laughs> and, and, and give us hope when we would normally actually be in despair and, and to give us perspective when we would actually be quite, you know, self-focused ourselves. I am not a patient person. No amens for my wife, please, at this moment. I am not a patient person in and of myself. But you know what? The Holy Spirit who lives in me is patient. He is exceedingly patient. And so I don't have to try harder to squeeze some patience out of my weary soul. Oh, no, no, no. I, I get to learn to receive the patience that the Holy Spirit has who already lives in me because I'm a follower of Christ. It's a very different form of Christianity, the try harder Christianity. You're supposed to be good, so try hard to be good. Well, that just tires you out after a while. Yes, we're supposed to be good, but not of ourselves. That takes us to a place of an I can't, I can't. God, I need you, I need you. And so we have this partnership where God enters into us by his spirit and helps us to live the life we could not otherwise live on our own. So, Lord, what are you going to do? Well, actually, what I'm going to do is send you my spirit so that you can be my witnesses because you're part of my plan. First mistake was about the when. Second mistake was about the who. And the third mistake was about the what that God was. The nation of Roman domination any longer. They weren't in charge of their own country. The Romans were all over the country with their soldiers and their government, and they wanted to have their own country back. And Lord, are you at this time. Now, there's interesting prophecies about all that, and you can get into all that if you want to about the nation of Israel. But at this moment, Jesus doesn't answer that question. He doesn't talk about the nation of Israel at that moment. He says, he's, they're asking, Lord, are you at this time going to let us have our, our nation back? And he actually he says, actually, there's a bigger story being written right here. And if they had read Isaiah carefully, and if they had read Genesis carefully, and if they had read Psalms carefully, they would have found out that through all of those texts, there's this theme that runs all throughout the Bible that God has a heart for the whole world. In fact, read the last of the book. There are, will be people from every tribe and tongue and nation and language in heaven. There will be representatives from every people group in heaven because the glory of God is too great to be revealed through Norwegians alone. <laughs> that's, that, that's, <laughs> I got a brother over here. Okay. <laughs> We need every rhythm and hue and spice and the nuance of the redeemed culture before the throne of God in heaven to more fully reflect the glory of God. So this is his plan. Said, yes, Israel is part of the plan, but there's a much bigger plan. And so he says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Where was Jerusalem? Well, it's right where they were. It's like Wickenburg. Just start right where you are, but don't get stuck there. Start right where you are. Right in your home, but don't get stuck there. And there, there was also Judea. What was Judea? What was the surrounding area? It was the Congress and Yarnell and all those great towns in the surrounding region. There's Samaria. What's Samaria? Samaria were people who lived close to them 
who were not like them. So they were in the vicinity, the geographic vicinity, but they weren't of the same affinity. <laughs> uh, different language, different cultural background, and so, wow, in the United States of America, there's all this mingling now of the nations and um, of us as as peoples are coming from all over and we have a Samaria like never before and I see it city after city I was in a market in Pennsylvania that we had been at 30 years earlier because our first church that Joanne and I pastored was in Pennsylvania and I came back to the same market and I didn't recognize it not because of the market but because of the population the world had come to Lancaster Pennsylvania couldn't believe it and that's happening. We have opportunities for Samarias like never before. And all the way to the ends of the earth. You're going to be my witnesses right where you are in your region, in the, among the Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth. You know, some people want to change one word in the Bible. They want to change the word and to or. So be my witnesses right, right where you are, or if you get around to it, maybe your region, or maybe if you're real spiritual, reach out to somebody who's not like you, or for that spiritual elite group, just a few small, you know, you guys go to the ends of the earth. No, that's, that's not the Bible. The Bible is and. and we have kind of this four-part plan for how to take the gospel to the world. And here's why you need to be teamed together, because it's one local church. We'll talk about this you know, later, but as one local church, it's impossible to do all four of those well. Reach your town, your region, your Samaria, and the ends of the earth. But when you team together with other churches, then it actually becomes possible. But there's a place for us to do something for the kingdom in all segments of human society. And so I see this not only as a plan, what Jesus said, You'll be my witnesses to every segment of society, but I also see it as a prophecy. It's going to happen. This is what God is going to do, and it's what he is doing. And in just a couple minutes, I'm going to take you on a tour of the world, the fastest tour you've ever been on, uh, to just let you know this prophecy is being fulfilled. This is happening. But before I get there, I just need to establish a couple more things. So, so they, had the, they had the mistakes in their questions, uh, and, and Jesus graciously, without rebuking them about their mistakes, just corrects them all in his answer. And in so doing, he's trying to lift our hearts and our heads to, to be part of the bigger thing that, that, he is, that he has come to do, to bring his love and salvation to the peoples of the world. So recently in the Middle East, well, there was a, one of our missionaries had a single copy of the Bible on her kitchen table, and Muslim women came sneaking into her house for this secret Bible study. It would not have been safe for them to be caught uh, coming in to study the scripture with a Christian, but they were hungry and so fully covered in their headdress, their head covering, they, they came into our home and gathered around the single copy of the Bible. And our missionary was explaining to them the gospel. When one of the Muslim women interrupted and said, I don't want to embarrass you, but you're just learning the Arabic language, and I think you just made a language mistake. Because you just told us that we could be forgiven of everything that we've ever done. Certainly, I misunderstood your Arabic because that's impossible. No, our missionary said, I didn't make a language mistake. That's what I tried to say because that's what the gospel says. That you can be forgiven of everything you've ever done. This is what Jesus came to do. Amen. Friends, we believe that's a justice issue, that you can still live in the world today and not know that forgiveness is available. You don't have to receive it. You don't have to enter into it. You don't have to welcome it if you don't want. But to not know that forgiveness is available is a very sad place to live and be. And so here's what it looks like mathematically for the three people in the room that like math. Okay, well, I'll do it anyway. So, so if you were to knock on a door here in the United States looking for a follower of Christ, and you knocked on a door every 15 minutes, within about an hour and a half here in the United States, you could find a Jesus follower. It would vary statistically from one place in the country to the next, but on average, within an hour and a half, you'd find a follower of Christ. Let's go over to Europe. 
If you want to find a follower of Jesus in Europe and you knocked on a door every 15 minutes for eight hours a day, within a day and a half, you'd find a follower of Christ. But I need to let you know there's still places in the world that do not have access to this message. Places where this Bible is forbidden, banned by the government, outlawed. Places where the church does not yet exist. Or if it does, it's in some very secret and quiet kind of way. So I'm talking about places in North Africa. Tunisia, Mauritania, Morocco, some of those kind of places. Uh, Middle East, uh, some of the Middle Eastern countries. I was just in Iraq and Jordan and Lebanon. Um, or former Soviet Union, the, like Tajikistan, Uz Uzbekistan, places we hardly ever hear about, but, but uh, that are full of people today who don't have access to the gospel. If you want to find a follower of Jesus, I, I said it'd take you an hour and a half. I said it'd take you a day and a half in Europe. If you want to find a follower of Jesus in the places I just mentioned and knocked on a door every 15 minutes for eight hours a day for 365 days a year, no vacation, no time off, for two and a half years, you'd finally find your very first follower of Christ. Start now and sometime, what's that, 2021, you'd find your first follower of Jesus. That's troubling. The 2,000 years after Christ gave us that message, there's still places in the world that don't have access to this message. But I want you to know you're part of a family that's doing something about that. I'm going to show you some pictures and tell you some stories right now of how we are taking the gospel to where it still needs to be taken and I would tell you these stories because these are your stories. This is the family you're already part of. I'm not trying to encourage you to do something you're not already doing. I'm coming to say thank you, Community Alliance, for engaging in this. Now, maybe some individuals in the church need to engage more fully. I don't know. That's, that's between you and the Lord. But I'm coming to say the leadership here, thank you for engaging. And, and so here's her. Here are a few of your stories. Let's start here in North America. If you were here last week, I think you heard me reference on video our founder, Dr. Simpson, who resigned from his church in New York City because they weren't very passionate about reaching the world for Christ. And he was very passionate about reaching the world for Christ. There he is as a younger man in the middle of that thing called the gospel carriage as they were taking the gospel to New York City. That's, that was his Jerusalem when I said, start where you are, but don't get stuck there. That's what I, that he was in New York City when he started out in the 1880s. And the first thing he did, oddly enough, was launch a magazine to uh, let people know about missions around the world. Pre-Google, pre-radio, how do you find out what's going on in the world for missions? Well, he wrote a magazine that still exists today as the Alliance Life. We're happy to send you a free subscription if you would like. Yes, that was a marketing thing right there. The next thing he did was start a local church. This is uh, the Gospel Tabernacle, which today is Johnny's Pizzeria, a half block from Times Square. Sadly, it's no longer a church. But that one church today exists as 2,000 other churches here in the United States, including three deaf congregations using American Sign Language, which this is one of the deaf congregations. Those churches, to those 2,000 churches in the last decade have baptized, no, that's just Ohio State Stadium. We don't care about that. They've baptized 122,000 people in the last decade, and we're celebrating that next week two more are going to be added to that list, and we celebrate their baptisms with you. The next thing that he did was start a missionary training institute. He was kind of an entrepreneur kind of guy. He was always starting something. How do you become a missionary in the 1880s? Well, he gave them away. He started a school, which exists today as four schools, uh, Tocoa Falls, Simpson, Crown, and Nyack. But their first graduates were sent to Africa. John Condit was the 20-year-old team leader who took them to Congo. Congo is today the Democratic Republic of Congo. If you watch the news carefully, it's where the latest Ebola outbreak is taking place. John brought his team there, 20-year-old John brought his team there and died two weeks later. <laughs> 
our first mission effort was very difficult. Most of the team got discouraged and came home. Only one team member remained. But today, in the Democratic Republic of Congo alone, you have more than a million brothers and sisters who are following Jesus in our Alliance churches and 2.3 million throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, including Guinea, which was the, one of the worst hit by the first round of the Ebola crisis. We came to help stop the spread of Ebola and to mourn with those who mourn. Gabon, we have a hospital that shares the gospel with every family member and patient that comes to that hospital. And through the Bangalo Hospital in the last two years, 3,500 people have come to faith in Christ. Burkina Faso is one of the poorest countries in the world where clean water is an issue, and so we send in short-term teams to work with the national church to provide clean water on the church property so that the local community can come to the church for drinking water and the living water of Christ. And the church is spreading, including among widows who, when they come to faith in Christ, leaving Islam, get ostracized by their families, we're following Jesus, so we come alongside the widows and give them care. Imagine a section of Arizona where, that was surrounded by churches, but that, that section of a few hundred square miles said, no, no churches, no Bible, no Christians allowed. We have no interest. Well, that's the case in Burkina Faso. We've tried to get into a region of that country for a long time with no welcome and no impact until just the last five years. This new wave of work is happening. And there's now 50 uh, new church plants happening as the national church and the missionaries work together in taking the church to where it's not previously existed. And if you watch these photos closely, you're gonna see that the same emblem that you have on the wall here Christ our Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King represented all across the world in various forms. That thing's like Coca-Cola in a lot of places in the world. <clears throat> the neighboring country is Mali, where I'm just telling you a few stories of the many, many stories from each of these countries. But one story from Mali is a children and women's hospital for a country that has had a huge birth, uh, uh, a loss of life at birth. And so um, the Kuchala Women and Children's Hospital has been established for, they celebrated their 10th anniversary and now 100,000 patients have been served delivering 20,000 babies, conducting a whole bunch of surgeries. And if you look closely at that picture, the very first baby girl that was born at the hospital is in the background of that shot. We rejoice with those who rejoice. The Church of Cote d'Ivoire, former Ivory Coast, is larger than the U.S. Christian Missionary Alliance with 500,000 members. 6,000 women recently came to an Alliance Women's Conference in Cote d'Ivoire, took an offering of $3,000 and gave it away to the persecuted Christians in the Middle East. Let's jump continents, okay? Ready? Another place in the world? Asia Pacific. Here we go. Robert Jaffrey walked away from a family fortune. He was heir to a newspaper chain throughout Canada and walked away from wealth to take the gospel to places that we now call Vietnam, China, Indonesia. And even as the Great Depression threatened to stop all of our work throughout the world, Jaffrey says, do you ask in view of the terrible economic depression of today, dare we go forward in these new fields and commence new work? Yea, rather may we ask this, dare we, in the face of the command of the Lord Jesus, in the face of the encouraging miracles he's working in our behalf, dare we hesitate for one moment? And so we move forward to places like Vietnam, where in the 1968 Tet Offensive, we lost seven of our missionaries due to martyrdom. Yet today, the National Church of Vietnam is more than a million strong. 60,000 people came to faith last year through our alliance work in Vietnam. It's just a joyful time there for the church. The communist 
confiscated our seminary and closed it down until recently. They gave us back one-tenth of our property. So if you can't build wide, build high. And so here's the new seminary uh, that's uh, being established uh, with uh, hundreds of students being trained to take the gospel to their country, including a 2,500-seat auditorium so that one person from every Alliance Church in Vietnam could come to a conference. Because they can't, they can't rent the local hockey, sta or excuse me, hockey. <laughs> they can't rent the local uh, soccer stadium or the local, you know, high school or the local anything because it's a communist country. They can't rent those buildings, but if they build their own building, they can preach whatever they want to preach inside it. So that's a big step of vision. Philippines, you can eat Asian food while still speaking English. What a wonderful country. And... Um, uh, we, we had a, lo a long history of planting churches in the rural areas, but university students would leave their outlying areas, come to the capital city and said, hey, would you start an Alliance Church for us in the capital city? So the capital city Alliance Church was formed. That church alone has planted 35 more churches. And throughout Manila, there's over 100 Alliance Churches from the most impoverished here I am in a squatter's village as the dogs came in and out of this building that didn't have doors or windows, but the congregation gathered to worship Jesus or this church that I was part of. You do see the church, right? <laughs> well, you got a good eye if you do, but up there on the second floor, there's Cells Alive Alliance Church that, uh, or the Christian Fellowship that's a, a joyful place. And this was a conference that I spoke at in the Philippines just remember that picture. I'm going to close with a story in a few minutes that uh, takes us back to that scene. Here are the missionary teams that they sent out. See, a lot of our national churches that we've established in some of these countries are now mission-sending churches. And you can get places with a Filipino or Ecuadorian passport that you can't get with an American passport. And so the missions movement is spreading beyond just our American Indonesia, a lovely people in a lovely country with uh, many unreached people groups, including the village that this gentleman moved into. The Indonesian here, as a pastor, came to plant a church where no church existed. And his first thing he did was start a coffee shop, just so he'd have a reason to be there. And he has that form of coffee that most of you probably have not tried, but some people are fans of animals are required in the production of this coffee. It's called Kapi Luwak. Anyway, if you don't know about it, ask somebody who's a coffee lover. He now has been able, through his coffee shop, to reach people for Christ, and a church has been planted where it's never existed before. Laos. It was the Andrianoff family that helped uh, that first took the gospel to Laos. They lived in such an isolated missionary outpost, they would only see their missionary colleagues once a year. It was a shaman that was the first to come to faith in Christ, helped them translate the Bible into the Hmong language. And today there's hundreds of thousands of Hmong believers. And this was just one Hmong youth conference in Wheaton, Illinois, that I spoke at recently. Japan, in spite of Dr. Jaffrey's insistence, we did not listen to him in Japan and withdrew our missionary team during the Great Depression. However, Mabel Francis, one of our missionaries, respectfully resigned and stayed in the country and was there to welcome us back. And eventually at age 83, Mabel received the highest civilian award that can be granted by the Japanese government for a lifetime of faithful service of that country. Yet still today, less than one half of 1% of Japanese follow Jesus. But this university student, the guy with the long hair, literally found a Bible in a Tokyo gutter found the Alliance Church because it was close to, his close to his favorite pizza place and found Jesus in that Alliance Church and today is studying for ministry. Let's go over to the Middle East, often on the news, rarely for good news, but the Bradens were the first of the Alliance to take the gospel there. George would travel by camel. 
uh, between Amman, Beirut, Jerusalem, got arrested numerous times for his evangelistic work. But today, Jesus is the light of the world, that sign says in Arabic, on top of that church building in Baghdad. <laughs> Pastor, Pastor Joseph as a survivor of a car bomb, walked away, the car was destroyed, everybody jaw dropped that you just walked out of that burning car. But uh, he boldly shares the gospel throughout Iraq. Jordan, a beautiful country where picture an Alliance Church of 50 people praying, how do we minister to more people? How do we win more people for Christ when the Syrian civil war breaks out and the refugees are spilling into their country by the hundreds of thousands, many of them right through their town. And so this church of 50 has now ministered to literally thousands of Syrian refugees the work continues uh, on through the years. 181 Syrian refugee children receiving a good education in the, in, in the school that our Alliance Church has started up with our help. Speaking of schools, in a Muslim community in a major metro area of Amman, Jordan, we've now started a Christian school. Why? Well, it's one more presence of the gospel the local Alliance Church saw an opportunity, and if you're a disabled, if you're a family that has a disabled child in that broad category of that word, Muslim schools rarely have opportunities for you to get a good education. So this Christian school is ministering to a wide range of kids. And throughout Jordan, your sister churches are vibrant and strong and have a medical clinic for the refugees that have spilled into their country, and we participate with that as well. Closer to home, Latin America, our Portuguese and Spanish-speaking neighbors to our south, it was through the river routes that we first brought the gospel there before roads were reliable. Peru, for example, there's a vibrant church throughout Peru, 180,000 members strong, sending out 60 of their own missionaries. We have Chinese work in Peru. <laughs> and no ministry is complete without a ping pong table, right? In my office in Colorado Springs, the president of the Peruvian Christian Missionary Alliance came to visit me, and Mario Rojas gave me this gift of the original ultramarathon runners. He didn't know that I liked to run, but he gave me this gift. These are the Chaskis. They were the heralds for the king throughout the Inca Empire, and he gave me that specific gift saying it was the Christian Missionary Alliance that first brought the gospel to our people. Thank you. We challenge you, continue to be a herald of the gospel to the world. And we're accepting that challenge. If you want to suffer for Jesus with us down in Dominican Republic, we can uh, put you to work down there for a short-term experience, including a church plant in Punta Cana. Did you know you've got sister churches in Cuba? That during the decades when the United States was not welcome in Cuba, Canadian and Peruvian alliance workers were. And so... Uh, we have about 80 sister churches now, vibrant expressions of the gospel in Cuba. And if you don't have rhythm before you get there, you're going to learn it <laughs> once you're there. This is my peer, the president of the uh, Cuban Christian Missionary Alliance, Yoel, who was a Marxist, atheist, communist, and proud of it. He knew that was the way of the intelligentsia. If you were an ignorant uh, person, you would have some spiritual belief. You'd believe there was a God. But if you were smart, you knew that there was no God until one day <laughs> a hand landed on his shoulder and a voice came to his ear that said, you're making a mockery of me. And he turned around and looked and there was nobody there. And the voice said, and besides, your life is a wreck. And he said, my life was a wreck, but nobody would be bold enough to tell me that because I was one of those macho guys that, you know, tried to look like everything was good. And that day he gave his heart to Christ. Took him a whole year. Took him a whole year in Castro, Cuba to get his own Bible. But today he's pastor and president of the, US, of the Cuban Alliance. You see the results of our years of service down there in 
Latin America, jumping over to Europe. Some people think the church in Europe is dead. We would beg to differ. Baptisms in Italy, the advancing of the church in Germany, including Spanish speakers living in Germany. There's a growth of the church there. Uh, there's uh, Syrian refugee work taking place in Berlin. You know that Germany was one of the largest receptors of Syrian refugees, and so we're there to minister. France, um, the vibrant Genesis Center, we can get you there to teach English as a second language, share the gospel in Paris. Three international churches, baptisms taking place over to Kosovo, a country we hardly ever hear about. This father, the freedom fighter, fought for his country's independence and was angry that it was now being used by Muslims to recruit, recruit terrorist fighters. And so he said, I didn't fight for that. He wanted something else. So he went in search of an evangelical pastor and a couple hundred kilometers away found one of our partner pastors who came to his village and now there's a brand new expression of the church arising where it has not previously existed. This was one of their recent baptisms. And in the capital city, occupational therapy never existed in Kosovo until our team arrived and brought that resource to them as well. You got one last region in you? You still alive? You still breathing? Okay, all right, great, we're still here. Russia. Uh, when the, when the, uh, my predecessor, Dr. Rambo, when the Soviet Union fell, sent numerous uh, new missionaries into Russia. And the result, 26 years later, is almost 100 churches that are now part of our, uh, the, the broader group that we connect with. In Mongolia, I am told that 30 years ago, you couldn't find six believers in all of Mongolia but today, we've got 30 church plants underway uh, throughout that fascinating country. And you're probably aware that there's some places in the world that I can't name their names uh, to let you know where, where we're at because of social media and the internet. It might endanger our teams there. But in a place we call Tea House, there's people coming to faith for the very first time in a place called Long Beach. They recently had a baptism of four people that were so joyful, they were literally running down the beach, giddy with joy for what they had done. And if you know the Bible well, you know there's a sentence in Hebrews 11 that after he's gone through this long list of all these people, Abraham and Moses and all these people, he finally gets to the point in saying, but I don't have time to tell of, and so I'm telling you, even though I've given you that list, I don't have time to tell of Angola, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, El Salvador, Ghana, Great Britain, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, India, Israel, Kenya, Lebanon, Mexico, Myanmar, Nepal, Niger, Panama, Portugal, Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Venezuela, more than a dozen countries I can't name, or Fiji, Finland, New Zealand, Australia, and let's sing it together. Oh, Canada. All right, good job. <laughs> All told, this Alliance family that you're part of is 6.3 million believers strong, 180 languages, 22,000 churches. All that came from the seeds of the guy who didn't make it two weeks. Fascinating, isn't it? If you ever come to Colorado Springs, you're invited to come to our office. We'd love to give you a tour. We have tours come through all the time, but this one was 40 people strong. This is just a partial picture of that group. I, I said, what's going on? 40 people. They said, well, we're from Minneapolis, St. Paul. Well, great. That didn't answer the question. They, they said, well, we're a family reunion. Well, good. That's great. I still don't get why Colorado Springs, why a whole bus full? And then they pointed to Grandma, the lady standing in white right in front of me. And they said, well, it was a Christian Missionary Alliance that first brought the gospel to our people. And it was grandma's desire that before she died, she'd get to see the home office of the Alliance. So that's why we're here. I cried that day. So this is, yeah, thank you. So just to repeat, this is what you're already part of. I come to say thank you for participating in this. If as individuals you haven't engaged yet in prayer and in financial giving and, and short term or whatever, God will lead you, God will lead you. But I'm here to just celebrate what, 
Wickenburg is part of. You really can reach the world from Wickenburg, Arizona. You're aware of that, right? And you're, you're living it out. I told you one last story, okay? And then I'll wrap. I said I was in Manila, Philippines for that conference. I don't usually use PowerPoint when I speak, so I don't usually need screens very much. And, um, but the director of the event asked if I'd give this presentation that required 18 photos and a video, and so I needed the screens. And it was the last morning of the event, and the screens had always worked fine. Now, when I say screens, don't just think in terms of this. This is the perfectly sized for this room. Wonderful, nice job. But this is an auditorium that held 4,000, so picture the kind of screens that were like jumbotrons, okay? There was one on each side, just like you have. And I got there to that service where I needed them, and they were totally black. Well, I didn't want to be the impatient American, so I just kept my mouth shut for a little bit. But the worship leader gets up there and has to do the say the line, sing a line, say the line, sing a line, because there's no lyrics on the screen. Finally, I asked the tech director what's going on. He says, no electricity. I don't know what no electricity means in Manila, but I don't think this is a good thing because they need more than a couple of AA batteries for those bad boys. So, so I prayed, and I prayed with my eyes open, and I watched, and the little flickers of digital nonsense came across the screen, and then I went black again. I was sitting next to a friend of mine, Don, who's from the College of Prayer. He's like Mr. Spiritual Warfare, okay? And I say, hey, Dan, Don, I need those screens, and Don does this. I don't know if demons can live in screens. If they can live in pigs, maybe they can live in screens. I don't know. But, but he's rebuking the demons. I got my eyes open. The whole screen lights up with digital nonsense and then goes black again. Well, now it's time for me to preach. And I'm standing up there and I'm distracted. Black, black, black. Oh, great. Finally, I just stopped. And I said to the congregation, you've noticed that these screens haven't worked all morning. I'm about to need them really badly. Would you just break into prayer huddles and pray? And so a thousand little prayer huddles broke into session just for a couple minutes. And within five minutes or less, those screens lit up, never flickered again, worked perfectly through my entire presentation. Amen. It's a fun story to tell. And you need to know you just got a one flicker president. Hey. Some groups don't get that. But anyway, you got that. <laughs> but their big point of the story is simply this. Recently, I was speaking here in the United States, and a Filipino woman came running up to me after the service and said, Hey, do you remember the time you spoke in the Philippines? Oh, yeah, I remember. I loved it. Remember that time in Manila when the screens didn't work? That service when he had us pray about the screens because the screens weren't working? Oh, yeah. And you remember how they all lit up and they worked? For She's telling me this whole story. They're still talking about it in Philippines because it became their story. Are you following me? If I had prayed and God had answered my prayers, I might have had a story to tell. Or if Don and I, we would prayed, we might have had a story to tell. But the kingdom of God rarely advances in this world through one or two people alone. It's not all supposed to be on the pastor. It's not all supposed to be on an elder or two. But the kingdom of God advances in this world through everybody finding their place to be involved. It's supposed to be everybody's story. But you, plural, southern y'all, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on y'all. And y'all will be my witnesses. Right where you are, but don't get stuck there. Because there's a region that needs this message. And there's a Samaria, people who live close to you that need this message. And there's still place in the world that not, have not yet heard that forgiveness is available. So Wickenburg... Community Alliance, God's used you. He's going to keep using you. But maybe somebody here is saying, hmm, I need to find a way to be more involved myself. It might be just showing up on Saturday and helping out with that food truck thing. So let's pray. Lord, it's been a sweet morning. I've enjoyed this congregation very much. Thank you for the good work of God you're doing in this place. Bless Pastor Monty and his leadership team and Ronnie. But we ask that everybody would see the Ephesians 2.10 good works prepared in advance for us to do kind of work. So bless this church in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, go ahead and stand as we...
have a closing song. And as we lift our hands, the heavens open, heavens open, so let our lives declare the love our God has spoken over us. I give thanks for all you have done, and I will sing of your mercy and your love, your failing Lord I am grateful I give thanks for all you have done I won't forget all the battles you have won your love is unfailing Lord I am grateful we're grateful today man Lord I am grateful dismissed here with the word of prayer before we do just again wasn't that great guys can we give god just glory for that thank you so much so fun to be involved in something so much bigger than ourselves and, and what a joy especially to have dr stumbo at the helm that's a real blessing uh, i want to share with you just real quick uh he out out in the foyer there's a table out there that has the books that that uh dr stumbo has written uh he talked about that 18 months of of illness that he went through that's what this, uh, this book here, it's called An Honest Look at a Mysterious Journey. He talks about this in that book. And this book here in the Treasures from the Midst, this was his journal, this was his blogs, his prayers during that dark time and that dark moment. Uh, both of these books, each of these are $10 each. And then he also wrote something that uh, is, is for a guy to give, you know, if you, if you want to speak to a guy and then flowers for the girl. And what this is, it's God and you, a conversation. What it is, it's a... Uh, it's an evangelistic type tool. It's a way to share the gospel. You could give this to, to those who don't know the Lord. And it's not a religious-y, real church kind of language. It's just a common everyday language to share the gospel in a way that's very, you know, not offensive in any way. So I encourage you, if you're interested in this, these are each $5 each. And so that you know, every bit of the proceeds, every bit of these books, and any money that's collected actually goes back into the Great Commission Fund to help empower the very thing that you've been watching as we've seen what God's doing in the world abroad. So I just want to make that available to you. Let's be dismissed with a word of prayer and again, give God glory. Father, we love you and thank you. We give you praise. You are such a good God, a wonderful God. Thank you for this incredible, incredible news today and encouragement from your word. Lord, that you're doing great and mighty things, not only here in Wickenburg and God in our Samaria, but God across the globe. God, we're part of a family that is so much larger than just us. And we thank you that we participate with you in advancing the gospel, not building an earthly empire, but advancing the kingdom of God to your glory. So God, take us from this place today, empower us, help that Holy Spirit power come upon us. And God, may we be your witnesses start in the moment we leave. God, we love you. We thank you. We give you the praise and the glory. It's in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.